Welcome to A Moment of Zen. Time to sit back and relax as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a sexy and wild ride covering the latest in film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective. Here's your host, Zen Sams. Welcome to the show, my sexy people. Remember to join me right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, every Saturday night from 7 to 8 p.m. And go to 710WOR.com to watch fully uploaded episodes. Please make sure to follow me on social media at Zen Sams, that is Zen with an X. And you can also text the word collaboration or feature me to 917-575-2321. 917-575-2321. Today's show is brought to you by Romulus Entertainment and Helen Yarmack International. I am really excited. We have three incredible guests on today's show. African-Canadian beauty queen, Nova Stevens. She was crowned Miss Universe Canada in 2020. She's a model and an activist and the first woman of Sudanese origin to compete at Miss Universe. We're gonna chat with her later in the show. We also have a beautiful comeback story. I love those. Calvin Buari has spent the past 22 years behind bars. He served 50 years to life sentence for murders he basically never committed. This is such an incredible story, guys. I can't wait to share his comeback story with you and how he changed his life around and the amazing service that he's providing for current inmates. This next interview is so special. We have Nelson Mandela's grandson joining us. Quaker will chat with us about what it's like to fill his grandfather's shoes, how raising a two-year-old in a pandemic as a single dad has changed his perspective on everything, and his newest venture that keeps his grandfather's legacy alive. Stay tuned. You're definitely not going to want to miss this. Coming up next, my dear friend, Kwaku Mandela joins us. Back in a minute. Get your moment of Zen every Saturday night at 7 p.m. as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a wild ride covering film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective right here on 710 WOR. Welcome back, guys. This is Zen Sams. You're listening to A Moment of Zen on 710 WOR, and we have Kwaku Mandela, a very, very special friend and special guest of the show. Uh, Kwaku Mandela is going to talk to us about everything he has going on, from fatherhood to all the wonderful projects he has lined up. Um, and we're going to kind of dive into where he's at in his life. You all know his grandfather. His grandfather was a widely regarded um, icon of democracy and social justice. And we know that that, that Nelson Mandela has received more than 250 honors, including the Nobel Peace Prize. And he was he has deep respect uh, within South Africa. And Kwaku, uh, of course, was born in South Africa and grew up in America. Uh, he attended APA International Film School in Sydney. And I am so excited to have him come on. Welcome, Kwaku. Thank you, Zan. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So tell us a little bit about, you know, I'm going to dive right into it because I'm so excited to have you on and, and talk to you about all the wonderful things um, that you're doing. But more importantly, before anything else, you are a dad. And oh. I, I am so excited to welcome you to the club. Parenthood is not an easy thing. Um, oh. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about what it's like, you know, being a dad, having a two-year-old, uh, living in the city, you're in the middle of a pandemic. Start off with that, because I think a lot of parents right now are, are you know, want to hear your perspective uh, on things. Like, it's the city, it's not as safe as it used to be. What's your feeling on this? You know, look, as a, as a new parent, as a single father, um, undoubtedly raising a kid during the pandemic has had its challenges. Um, you know, uh, I think isolation, um, you know, feeling like you don't necessarily have the support system that you would. You know, we talked about this kind of, you know, several times about how, you know, you not having your mother here, uh, you know, me feeling the same, not having my close family here um, that you can kind of rely on to support you uh, was a big thing. But I also think um, it's been a remarkable time. I mean, I've got to know 
my child in a way that I never thought was possible um, because we had so much time to really bond. And, you know, I think the, the whole thing of being a parent is you start to see the world through someone else's eyes, right? And, you know, any notions of kind of selfishness um, or, or, you know, lack of desire to actually positively impact the world around you, I think, go away for most parents, um, you know, because they start to focus on their children, they start to focus on the future of those children. So for me, that's, that's definitely been a kind of seminal moment in my life. Um, the bachelor days are over, so to speak. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm learning about the world in a new way. And I love, I love every moment of that. That's amazing. What's your son's name? His name's Kai Kwame. Kai Kwame Mandela. Correct. That's beautiful. And Kwaku, tell me he's two, right? He's just under two. He's 17 months. He's 17 months. So what is, you know, the world is a scary place. And I have a five-year-old. And as a mom, I worry every day about the environment she's growing up in, about, you know, the world where it's at right now, where we feel more divided than ever when we really should be uh, uniting. Um, and you're all about, you know, positive energy. You're a philanthropist, you're an activist, uh, you have a lot going on. You're also, like me, uh, in the film industry. I'm an actor, you're a producer, and you, you went to school um, in Sydney, right? So you went to school abroad. Mm -hmm. and, but, but you grew up in America, and you grew up with your, your family. I mean, you grew up knowing your grandfather well, or what was your relationship at that point with your grandfather? I mean, he died in 2013? He passed away in 2013, but, um, you know, I, I first got to meet him in 1989 um, when I was four and a half years old. He was still under house arrest in a place called Victor Vestere. Um, and then I went back to South Africa in 1995, I believe, when I was 10 years old. And I would spend the next 10 years of my life uh, in South Africa and, and really kind of uh, get to know him well and get to know, you know, the rest of my extended family, my cousins. Um, you know, my nieces and nephews. And so I had, the, I would say, a healthy amount of time to, to spend with my grandfather and also to spend in South Africa, which was so important to me. That's amazing. And so you had, were you close with your grandfather? You had a good relationship with him? I did. That's yeah. amazing. So you have a, a very, uh, you have a great role model there and you have some important shoes to fill. Do you ever feel that there is pressure for you to fill these shoes as Nelson Mandela's grandson? You know, it's interesting. I was talking to, um, you know, a friend of mine, um, a new friend of mine, Amanda Demi, a really amazing photographer who, you know, was talking to me about legacy. Um, and, you know, the fact that oftentimes, you know, the kids of people who have these larger than life legacies can really struggle um, with that because they feel consumed by it. Um, you know, I think when I was younger, that was definitely the case. It, it's a gift and a curse, and you know, I'm sure lots of people say this, and that's the reality for every single human being, because every single human being comes from something, right? They had grandparents, they had parents who had expectations for them, right? They also, you know, tried to leave their own legacy in the world, right? Whether that's with their friends, whether that's with their own families, whether that's with their own communities, right? And you ultimately um, are, in a sense, judged by that, right? Um, and, and in a way, you know, you have a choice. You can either try and fulfill those traditions, try and fulfill those cultures, or you can decide, you know, I, I want to honor those, but I also want to make my own, right? I want to be defined by who I am and not someone else. And I think for me, that's been a big thing um, that I've learned. And just going back to kind of what you said at the, the beginning of the segment about, you know, us raising kids in this world and um, this being a really scary time, you know, I think it's always been a scary time in the world, to be honest with you. We've always been dealing with different issues, whether it's been wars, whether it's been, you know, a lack of resources or climate change, um, you know, or, you know, the advent of there being uh, really bad people out there in the world. I made this, this film with Tribeca Films uh, years ago, actually in 2013, um, called The Truth with Hank Willis Thomas, where we took a booth around the world and ask people a simple question, you know, what's their truth? Um, and it was remarkable to see the answers, um, to see, you know, what people were searching for, what people were experiencing. You know, we went from Afghanistan to Ireland to all throughout the United States. 
Yeah. Um, and there were a lot of areas of similarity, but there were also a lot of areas where people diverged. That's amazing. Um, Quaker, we're gonna we're gonna really dive into some of the more current projects that you have going on because what you just said was was pretty incredible in the way that that film was something that was very proactive. And I think people like to see uh, you know, filmmakers and producers bring proactive content where people are actually responding uh, and you evoke that emotional response. Uh, we're gonna come back after this commercial break and more with Kwaku Mandela. Get your moment of zen every Saturday night at 7 p.m. as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a wild ride covering film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective right here on 710 WOR. Welcome back, guys. You're listening to A Moment of Zen on 710 WOR. I'm your host, Zen Sams. We have Kwaku Mandela that we've been talking to, and we have him for a little bit longer. Um, I want to pick his brain about what uh, projects he has going on, because Kwaku always has something very interesting and very powerful up his sleeve for as long as I've known him. And it's been a couple of years since Kwaku and I have been friends now, and we've transitioned from uh, the single life to the parenthood life. And now uh, Kwaku is a dad, two years old. He's got the most, he's been blessed with the most wonderful child. He just talked to us about um, all those things that that kind of made him who he is today. And Kwaku, can I ask you an honest question? And this is really something like friend to friend. Go for it. When you were, when your son was born and when you held him for the first time, and this sounds so cheesy, but when when this happened with Alexa and they placed her in my arms, I had like these goosebumps and it was like this electricity that just flew right through me. It's almost like you've been touched by, you know, divine intervention or you have this beautiful life that's been placed in your arms. Um, and your, your son was born two years ago. How did that feel? Like, was that a surreal moment for you? Cause for me, it ha it has been a very surreal moment and still is when I see my child and when I hold her, is that just a girl thing? No, no. I, I mean, I think for me, I remember um, holding him for the first time his eyes had been closed and he just opened his eyes and he, you know, he looked straight at me. Um, and it was like, he was kind of looking through me, um, or he knew me. Um, it was a profound and remarkable feeling that, you know, will stay with me for the rest of my life. Uh, and I think for me solidified the start of a bond, um, you know, with kind of hopefully my best friend, I hope we'll be best friends, but who knows, you know, um, <laughs> We'll see if he even likes me in a couple of years. Oh, stop it. Uh, he will love you and you will be best friends. I know how much you love that little boy. Every time I talk to you, he's always either in the background or you're holding him or you're trying to figure out his schedule. So I know that you're a very committed dad and being a single dad is not easy. So I take my hat off to you because believe me, I've raised Alexa alongside my lifelong partner and my best friend and husband, uh, Brad Feinstein, who you know very well too. He's uh, one of your very close friends. And uh, believe me, braising Alexa, if I had to do that by myself, it would not be the same experience. So uh, Kwaku, man, you, you got you got it going on, brother. Um, I appreciate that. The, <laughs> what I also wanted to ask you is, you mentioned uh, the other day when we were talking um, that you have a new project coming up and that you are launching Freedom Radio. And I wanted I want you to tell the audience how this project came to fruition, why you're doing it, and what your goal is. And then let's just get everybody to start, you know, signing up because this is this is a movement that you're starting. I appreciate that. Yeah, Zen, it's um it's something that I began working on probably about two and a half years ago. Um around the 30th anniversary release of my grandfather from prison and looking at the kind of notion of what modern day freedom meant and represented to people. Um, I had the, the kind of great opportunity of meeting a young artist um, and MIT lab fellow named Ekene Ijimo. Um, and he came up with this concept of freedom radio, which is a machine learning uh, platform that essentially anyone in the world can call into um, and you're prompted um, to answer questions around what freedom means to you. And uh, it will launch on April the 27th. Um, I think, you know, in the last year, all of society and humanity has really learned kind of a new found appreciation of the freedoms we once had. 
uh, and what that means going forward. And I think it's different, you know, every suburb you go to, every state you go to, every country you go to. Um, what a girl, you know, experiences in Greece in a refugee camp where she's looking for freedom of movement is very different to what someone in Brooklyn, New York represents and feels or someone that lives in New Jersey feels. And so we're trying to, you know, collect as much as that, much as that insight as possible and then connect those streams um, in a really cool interactive radio station that we'll be launching um, at the end of the summer. So I'm really excited about the project. Um, I think there's a lot of potential. It's also the first kind of pillar of the Freedom Project, which is a bigger initiative that we're doing around my grandfather's legacy and also engaging, uh, you know, generally people to, to own their sense of freedom. That's incredible. So already you're definitely living up uh, <laughs> to all of his expectations. I think he would be so proud of you. I know I am. And I talk about you all the time and everything that you have going on, because not only are you incredible, are you an incredible filmmaker, but you have these incredible ideas that unify uh, rather than divide. You're not, you know, you don't like to peg people one against the other. You actually like to be the peacemaker from uh, from what I've known you and uh, known you to be and seen throughout the years which makes you so much more lovable uh than the average person in hollywood uh but what what is also c quite unique is that you're this platform freedom radio um it you kind of thought this up in the middle of the pandemic right because that's kind of what motivated you to really get everybody um you brought your vision and you kind of collaborated with all the right people is there going to be an actual platform not just radio that will piggyback off of this where people can collectively get together well yeah i mean i think again freedom radio is really the start um, of this initiative and it's not just you know typical kind of audio radio there's also a visual element to it um, that people will be able to enjoy by going to you know freedom.radio website but our whole thing is is uh, you know there's communities that exist out there already um, the, the key kind of aspect for us is how do we begin to connect those communities? Yeah. Um, how do we get people to understand that their version of freedom or their version of life is not that different from ours? Um, and I think that's such an important um, kind of tool. It also will lay the foundation for something that we want uh, to present to the United Nations in 2022 um, that hopefully uh, I think will lead to a better and more sound world. Uh, but that comes from us learning, again, what modern day freedom really represents in this day and age. Incredible. And on the film side, you are producing um, a documentary about your grandfather's legacy. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's called Troublemaker. Um, we started just over a decade ago. Uh, it features the last recorded interview um, with my grandfather and also interviews with 21 of my cousins, nieces, nephews, um, you know, talking about their experience growing up in South Africa, growing up uh, during apartheid and growing up around him. And so uh, we're hoping to have that finished this summer, which I'm really excited about. Equally, I just uh, took a film to Sundance, a film festival called El Planita, uh, the directorial debut of a really talented Argentinian filmmaker, Amelia Oman. And that was just picked up by Utopia distribution. Uh, so that's hopefully going to come out in either the third or fourth quarter of this year. Wow, you, you're quite the busy man, all with a two year old on your uh, in, in the Bjorn. Do you wear a Bjorn? I do wear a baby Bjorn. Oh my God, I love you even more. Stop it right now. The Bjorn ruled my life up until probably uh, a year and a half ago. That's so embarrassing. And How Alexa else do you do park runs and go to the grocery store, right? Yes. Oh. The and believe me, the Bjorn was my best friend. I had her in that thing. She only would go to sleep in the Bjorn. Uh, oh, that's a separate conversation. That's like a, a, the, the mommy segment, but we'll have you on for that one too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we also have, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, do you mind staying on my thread and 
uh, meeting Nova Stevens, who's coming on uh, in the next couple of moments. Oh, she's she's going to be joining us. She's a Canadian model. She's an activist. She's a beauty pageant title holder who was crowned Miss Universe Canada in 2020. And she's going to go on to represent Canada at Miss Universe 2021 this May. Um, and she's also the first woman of Sudanese origin to compete at Miss Universe. She has an incredible and remarkable story, Kwaku. And uh, if you have a few moments, I'd love for you to meet her. I mean, listen, you know, she's the sweetest of sweetest. And why wouldn't you want to meet a Miss Universe? She sounds phenomenal. I'd be, I'd be happy to stay on. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, great. Uh, we'll be back right after this with Nova Stevens and Kwaku Mandela. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Get your moment of Zen every Saturday night at 7 p.m. as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a wild ride covering film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the Millennial Moms perspective right here on 710 WOR. Welcome back. This is Zen Sams. You're listening to A Moment of Zen on 710 WOR. We've had the pleasure of talking to Kwaku Mandela so far and Joining us now, we have Nova Stevens. She's a Canadian model, activist, and beauty pageant title holder who was crowned Miss Canada Universe in 2020. And she's going on to represent Canada at Miss Universe uh, this coming May. She's also going to be the first woman of Sudanese origin to compete at Miss Universe. Welcoming now, we have Nova Stevens. Thank you for joining our conversation. We still also have Kwaku. Nova, welcome. Hi, Zen. Hi, Kwaku. So nice to meet all, all of you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I am so honored that you are on the show. Number one, congratulations for making it this far. You are making many proud. Uh, and I thought it was important for the two of you to meet. Number one, you guys have so much in common. You're both activists your love of Africa, your love of children. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick quick introduction because Kwaku doesn't have too much time left. But Kwaku is working on on a project that he wants to talk to you about that perhaps may interest you. So Kwaku, I'm going to let you take it from here. Appreciate that. Great to see you again, Nova, and I hope you're well. Um, I was just telling Zen about Orphan Myth, which is a campaign um, that I'm working on with Tiffany Haddish and Ben mm -hmm. Higgins um, in the next month to really dispel common myths um, around the orf orphan kind of crisis in America. Um, mm -hmm. And to hopefully raise not only awareness, um, but the ability to start addressing and changing these things for the vulnerable kids that are caught up in that system. And orphan and orphanmyth.com is looking for um, ambassadors. And we were thinking that maybe you wanted to join. I feel honored that you thought of me, you know, although I'm not technically an orphan, I grew up kind of like an orphan in, in, um, in Canada without my family. So, of course, I would love to. Yeah, I would love to join. Thank you so much. Yay. OK, great. So, Kwaku, of course, I will I will connect you guys after the interview. But moving on to something extremely important that I thought unified both of you when you uh, found out that I was uh, going to be chatting with Kwaku today. You were very excited, and I was very excited to introduce you guys, not just for OrphanMyth.com, uh, but for, for all the stuff that you have going on. I'm sure you have questions uh, you'd like to ask him, so I'm going to uh, allow you to just let your personality shine. <clears throat> this is the pre-pageant moment. You are listening to <laughs> A Moment of Zen, 710 WOR, and we have Miss Universe Canada competing here. Okay, good. I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> yes, I just, um, what, what, what would my role be exactly as an ambassador? Well, um, you know, I think it would be similar to my role, um, mm -hmm. just to lend your name and ultimately your time um, to helping publicize and encourage the general public to learn more um, about the current orphan uh, crisis that's happening in America. America. And if and if you allow me, um, this is something very private, but something very um, public knowledge that you were sent off at six years old uh, to Canada when your mother was uh, went into the refugee camp and you had to leave your family behind. At six years old, you were basically on your own with a, a distant cousin, so to speak. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you have a connection to your roots and you are now going to be going back after 20 years, you haven't seen your mom and you haven't seen your family. Um, 
Kweku and I were just talking about what it's like not to have our parents around and not to be able to have that ability. Um, my mom, you know, she lives in Canada and even with the pandemic, guess what? The pandemic sees no border. A, a, a flight that used to be 45 minutes, there's now you have to go there, quarantine for 10 days or two weeks when you go and come back. Your life has to literally be put on, on hold just to go see a family member. So I can't imagine what it feels like to never having laid eyes on your parents and on your siblings. Um, Kweku, do you have any questions for her based on that? I mean, that's a kind of like a, a very unique uh, experience as a child to go through. It is, um, and I think it's a remarkable one, and obviously, you know, probably built a lot of the character that we see uh, in Nova now. I think um, I'd love to know, you know, one, why are you competing in, in Miss Universe, and, uh, you know, if you end up making it and winning it, what would you do, um, uh, you know, with that newfound role? For sure. The reason as to why I want to win Miss Universe is because I want to make an impact and I want to create change. You know, Miss Universe is such a big, it's such a big um, platform. I want to use that platform to continue the conversations of inclusion, diversity, equality, and show that there isn't necessarily one type of beauty, that there's so many types of beauty and women are so multifaceted and we should all be celebrated. I don't think that's just all that I want to do. There's so much that I want to do and Miss Universe will allow me to, you know, will open doors for me to do all the other stuff that I want to do. That's amazing. Um, when I first met Nova, she uh, said to me something that was incredibly uh, inspirational. Um, you said that, you know, you have to make your own destiny and you can't be a victim of your of your circumstances and you know hide you, a million million of excuses why uh we could fail right but you after what you went through you said that the power of faith is being able to change your circumstances and number one it's i think what you've done but it's also what kwaku has done it's also what um what i have done and that ties us uh in a very unique way especially in this conversation but more importantly um nova when you are asked what it's like at six years old or at 15 years old to never have had that mother figure from your actual biological mother and have to depend on other people around you to really shape who you have become. Does that, um, does that make you feel um, sort of like you've been cheated uh, from, from that mother daughter bond? How do you, how do you feel about that? Because look, we, we all have these unique experiences, but to not be able to have your mother in your life, that's major. Oh, you're gonna make me emotional. Um, you know, growing up without my family has definitely been difficult, but I can say it has shaped who I am and had definitely made me stronger. And I can't say that I have done it alone. You know, Kanda has been so gracious enough and, to raising me. I can't say that I completely raised myself. Canada raised me. There were organizations that supported me. One of those organizations was called Aspen Family Transition into Adulthood. So the reason as to why I decided to go back to Africa to see my family after so long is because of exactly what happened this year. COVID Got has, it. has changed a lot. And you know what, Nova, why don't we take a minute, take a deep breath. We'll be right back after this. Kweku, thank you so much for joining us. Nova, we're going to continue talking about all the wonderful things you have going on, but I'm so happy and blessed to have you on this thread. Have a wonderful day, Kweku. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Zen. Such a pleasure, Nova. Get your moment of Zen every Saturday night at 7 p.m. as model, actress, mentor, and super mom Zen Sams takes you on a wild ride covering film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective right here on 710 WOR. Welcome back. This is your host, Zen Sams. You're listening to A Moment of Zen on 710 WOR, Voice of New York. We are so honored to have Nova Stevens joining us and we're going to continue our conversation. So Nova, uh, you recently um, just in the in the interview prior with Kweku Mandela mentioned that Canada was your mother and I know that your uh, your family fled a brutal civil war in South Sudan when uh, you were just a child and you were sent alone to Canada at age six. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, how that felt to number one get there without your family uh what what did they tell you and then how has that 
uh, shaped who you are today? Yes, leaving Africa at the age of six with my cousin, I honestly felt as though it was <laughs> a vacation. And then uh, time passed by, I realized it was no longer a vacation. I lived with that cousin up until about, I would say 13. And then I, because her and I didn't get along, she was really abusive emotionally, physically, you name it. So then I went and lived with um, another relative of mine who was better, um, but I had to pay rent, which when I look back, it's kind of odd that a 14 year old had to pay rent at that age. But you know, it's, it's stuff like that that make you who you are. I've really grown from those experiences. Wow. And so when you went to, um, to, when you went to Canada, we met, you mentioned to me that you ended up uh, with a wonderful organization in Calgary that really helped shape how you viewed, you know, your responsibilities in life. Can you tell me about that experience? Yes. Yeah, so obviously living with relatives what did not work out for me. So I decided to live on my own. And with the help of Aspen family, just transition into adulthood, I was able to learn to be independent at a very young age. And that was from 15 up until university for me. Yeah. And you were sending money back to your tribe. Is that correct? Yeah, essentially. Um, when you're sent to Africa, when you're sent to Canada from Africa, there's that expectation of you have to take care of your family, and that not is not just your immediate family, but your extended family as well, which is and a lot. For a young which girl. is which is a lot. And do you feel that connection to those roots still? Um, do you think that the burden of res of that kind of responsibility should be on on the children? How, what's your view from a? And I know you're not. Uh, uh, you haven't bared children, but you have raised children and you've been a very active uh, uh, parent, so to speak, in children's lives. Um, how do you feel about that? You know, my heart goes out to them. I understand that they don't have a lot, but as someone that is, has been on the other side, it is a lot to bear at, at a young age. There are times where I've had to put their needs ahead of my own. And I don't think any child should ever have to do that. But at the end of the day, they are your family and family comes first for me. Amazing. So that has helped really kind of uh, shaped you into the woman you are today. And for many reasons why you hold the title that you do, Canada should be so proud. I am so proud. I'm Canadian and I couldn't be more proud. Uh, vive le Canada. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't be more proud. Uh, but more importantly, you're now going to be competing for a huge, huge crown. And this is this is next level stuff. Um, mm. What advice would you give to anyone out there who wants to break into the modeling industry, the pageant industry? Uh, because you've come such a long way, basically by yourself. Mm -hmm. Never give up. You know, I competed three times before winning Miss Universe Canada. So if you really want something, you have to keep going until you achieve it. And you competed and got rejected the first couple of times. Can you tell me why you were rejected? You know, it's hard to say. Um, the second time I felt as though it's because of my decision to go natural. But again, what does that mean? I just felt as though society was not ready to celebrate a woman that looked like me. You know, for the longest time, I felt as though Eurocentric features were more celebrated than African features. So that's how I felt. But that may not be the case, but that's how I felt at the time. And you did say to me that in one of the entries, uh, they denied you and then you changed your hair. Tell me about that. And you recompeted or, or re or and then you were approved. Is that correct? Uh, no. So the first time I competed, I had the weave and okay. I'm top 12. The second time I cut my hair short and I only ended up making top 20. So in my mind, I felt as though I was demoted simply because I changed how I look. I went from a more natural look as opposed to what society considered as more beautiful. Well, and now guess what? Guess I what? You have no hair. <laughs> no hair. I well, love it. <laughs> no, no, no. You are so beautiful and graceful. You light up the room. Um, so you are you nervous for this coming May? Um, a little bit. I feel like there's a lot of expectations that I put on myself as well as those around me. I have so many supporters, supporters, which I'm so grateful for. But with so that this coming May, you're going to be competing for the title in um, my it's going to be in Florida, in Miami. 
yes. It's, uh, it's going to be in Hollywood, Hollywood, Florida. Know, Hollywood, Florida. There you go. So we're going to be uh, eagerly plugged in to our TV screens to make sure that you are crowned Miss Universe. Uh, but what, it, what, advice uh, separate of what you the advice that you could give to girls who want to you know get started uh, obviously be unique be yourself uh, persevere all of that good stuff but at the end of the day we live in a pandemic we're living in a in a post pandemic but still kind of really pandemic era things are just not back to normal things are not the same um, yeah. what did this pandemic teach you it taught me that we are the same, you know, no one is superior to another. In terms of COVID, COVID has taught us that any life is not, sorry, no life is more valuable than the next one, which is why I decided to go back home because tomorrow's not a promise. I don't ever want my parents to leave this planet without me seeing them. That's amazing. And you have not seen your parents in 20 years and you will be reunited with your mother. Uh, can you tell me very quickly when that's taking place? April 14th is when I'm going to go to Africa. <laughs> oh my goodness. And that would, that's going to be a very emotional moment, which I know you're going to capture on, uh, on video for us. And I know that there's cameras following you, uh, guys, I have to, uh, log off now and I have to get to my next guest, but I have to say that interviewing Nova Stevens has been one of the best interviews because you have given me so much insight into your life. Not only do I, I look up to you and I have a girl crush on you now for sure, but I also have to say that I'm very excited to, um, to become an ambassador with you for the orphan um, myth.com. And I, and that's a huge and a really, really cool program guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're listening to, Moment of Zen. I'm your host, Zen Sams on 710 WOR. That was Nova Stevens. Get your moment of Zen every Saturday night at 7 p.m. as model, actress, mentor, and super mom Zen Sams takes you on a wild ride covering film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective right here on 710 WOR. Your red carpet style moment of the week is brought to you by Helen Yarmack. Jamie Chung made a powerful style statement in support of Asian Americans at the 2021 SAG Awards last Sunday. A powerful red carpet moment indeed it was. Jamie showed up wearing a bright and bold red gown by Oscar de la Renta. The vibrant number featured a plunging neckline, body hugging silhouette and an explosion of floral petals that delicately draped over her shoulders. She paired her design with matching strappy sandal heels, and then she took to Instagram just hours before the ceremony kicked off, and she shared more details about her fashion statement. Jamie said, in Asian culture, the color red symbolizes luck, joy, and happiness. But aside from the Sucker Punch's star's dazzling ensemble, it was her crimson color handbag that captured everyone's attention. The 37-year-old actress who was nominated for a SAG Award proudly held up her clutch, which included a powerful message emblazoned on the front, stop Asian hate. That was your red carpet style moment, brought to you by Helen Yarmack International. Get your moment of Zen every Saturday night at 7 p.m. as model, actress, mentor, and super mom Zen Sams takes you on a wild ride covering film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective, right here on 710 WOR. Welcome back. We're here in Midtown Manhattan on Fifth Avenue at Helen Yarmack's showroom. You're listening to A Moment of Zen on 710 WOR. I'm your host, Zen Sams. This interview is brought to you by Helen Yarmack. Now, before I bring on my next guest, Calvin Bowery, he's a former crack dealer from the Bronx who served 22 years for a double murder he did not commit. And let me set the stage with some key facts about wrongful imprisonment. For starters, there's more innocent people in our jails and prisons today than ever before. Now, the rate of exonerations is also continuing to rise, revealing a very unreliable system of criminal justice. Due in part to a lack of accountability for police and prosecutors, reliance on junk science and mistaken eyewitnesses, these are the major contributors to wrongful convictions that have undermined the credibility of our very system. Now, it's ruined the lives of innocent of men and women. And there's some very alarming rates that I want my listeners to know about. This is what caught my attention. 
African Americans are burdened by a presumption of guilt that most defense lawyers are just not prepared to overcome. Now, as a result, African Americans make up 47% of exonerations, even though they're only 13% of the population. Innocent black people are about seven times more likely to be convicted of murder than innocent white people. And black people who are convicted of murder are about 50% more likely to be innocent than non-black people convicted of murder. Now here to make us proud and here to help us make sense of it all is our very special guest, Calvin Buari. Welcome, Calvin. I am so honored and so proud that you are on my show. And I can't wear, uh, can't wear, <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't wait to share your incredible comeback story. Can you talk us through this story of, of false imprisonment that basically took 22 years of your life away? I mean, if you're dealing with a draconian prison system, like you said, I never felt like the saying goes like you're innocent till proven guilty. I always felt from the very beginning that I was arrested, I was guilty until proven innocent. And that was just the circumstance in my case. Now you are obviously, you were falsely imprisoned. Uh, you were set up, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, things that went wrong with your case, but ultimately yes. justice prevailed and you sued the city. Tell me, tell me about that. I mean, I, I just sued the city um, at the state level. I settled with the state for 3.75. And I also have a federal lawsuit that I'm currently waiting on the finalization of as well. So you sued for $3.75 million and won, and you have another pending case. Is that correct? Yeah, that, was, that was with the state. And um, I have a current, another pending case with the federal court, yes. That's amazing. Congratulations mm -hmm. on that. Do you yeah. have, um, do you have, you have, you're very entrepreneurial. Absolutely. What, what can you tell our listeners about what, what inspired you to become a businessman while you were in jail and also taking a negative and turning it into a positive? I mean, you could have been plagued with anger and really used that to fuel your next chapter, but you didn't. You, in fact, used forgiveness and you used, you know, finding your own way. Uh, tell us what that was like while you were in jail. I mean, I think Frederick Douglass had a great saying that he says, there's no progress without struggle. And, you know, it's sad to say, but I think that a lot of my growth came through my struggle with my imprisonment because I really didn't get to understand my greatest potential of myself until I was incarcerated. You know, like I said, I was selling drugs before and I didn't have my father in my life. So I kind of like got misguided when I, in my youth. And I started to think that this was the only way of survival with how I came up and the guys that I looked up to. But when I went to prison, what I found out is that being a drug dealer just sell drugs. I'm a hustler. A hustler could sell anything. So when I was in prison, I started a catalog company, which was called Stay Up and Do You, where I was actually to the first business inside of prison to get Timberlands, Gucci sneakers, Uptown Nikes, where I was able to accumulate up to 75000 a week off of Timberland construction boots alone. Wow. And so... Uh Tell me a little bit about how, when you started uh, the Uber of prison visits, which is a, a company that uh, was really born out of you being in jail and you really wanting to make a difference when you came out. So it's Riders Van Service, and it's an Uber-like transportation company to shuttle family members of inmates to and from correctional facilities. And mm -hmm. you have now had very uh, much success with it, with this business. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about what this business is and how uh, people can find find out more about it? Um, basically, how the business started is because I have to give great, you know what I'm saying, love for the people that supported me while I was in prison. And um, what I acknowledged that, you know, when I was in prison, that the um, they were shuttling people up to the um, prison and these old rinky dink vans and they were stuffing them in there like, you know, sardines in a tuna can. And I just always felt like 
visits from your loved ones is one of the most important things while you're incarcerated because it keeps you implemented back into society. And because of that, I wanted to bring a better service to the prison system. And I was actually the first service in New York State to actually get Mercedes-Benz Sprinters and S Mercedes-Benz cars to actually shuttle these inmates, family members to the jail. And I got a great reception from it. And I'm the number one van service in the downstate region currently at this present time. Amazing. And what's that website? The website, I'm currently working on the app and the website right now because my host that I had previously ran my website, he had passed away. So now where I'm down here now back with another app and website developer, and we will be getting the website back up at ridersvanservice.com. All right, there you go. And now you've always consistently maintained your innocence um, at trial and throughout the numerous years that you were um, branded as a murderer. And you had you basically were restricted in, in, in having the ability to clear your name because of the circumstances around you. And then you turned it all around. Now you're a businessman and entrepreneur. One of your businesses is a recording studio uh, right there in Houston, Texas. Tell us about that. That's interesting. Yes, absolutely. That's where I'm currently at right now. I'm at Houston. Hit House here in Houston, Texas. Um, we currently just put out an album called Unk. You can check it out on YouTube, and you could also check us out at Houston Hit House on Instagram. Amazing, amazing. So what advice do you have, lastly, before we leave our listeners here, to anybody out there who truly is, number one, who has been falsely um, imprisoned, who has been in the system uh, and just holding on for hope that they can be exonerated. Like you, you're a judge vacated um, your case, you were exonerated, uh, that was your saving grace, but that's not the case for, for, for a lot of uh, prisoners out there. What advice do you have for them? I'm a, I'm a just basically saying, no matter what challenge you face or adversity, never give up. You know, I mean, like it was so surmountable, like getting denied like five times by the courts. And when you're fighting a big machine as, as the system, you start to lose hope. And I'm just I just thank God that I never lost hope. And that hope, you know, carried me through to bring me to where I'm at today. So I hope that I could be an inspiration for all of the fellas that are still inside prison and some that are wrongly convicted to let them know it's a life outside of what they're going through and just never give up. There you go. You heard it first right here on the moment of Zen. That's Calvin Buari, incredible story. Thank you for tuning in. This is your host Zen Sams on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. Get your moment of zen every Saturday night at 7 p.m. As model, actress, mentor, and supermom, Zen Sams takes you on a wild ride. Covering film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective. Right here on 710 WOR. Your moment of zen movie pick of the week is brought to you by Romulus Entertainment. And that movie pick is Dreamland, starring Margot Robbie and Finn Cole. It's definitely your date night movie. Margot plays a bank robber who basically steals a boy's heart. There is a Bonnie and Clyde vibe happening, and this takes place in a small town in Texas during the 1930s Great Depression. Eugene Evans, played by Finn Cole, lives with his family in a small town. They set it up visually where the land is drought and dust storms plague the country. And when Eugene is five, his father abandons his family. He lives his days stealing dime novels with his buddy Joseph and fantasizing of another life. And then his mother basically remarries um, and she marries a man who does his best to act as a figure to Eugene. Now, one day there's a town meeting that takes place and a sheriff shows a wanted poster um, of Alison Wells, played by Margot Robbie, to the town. And they basically realize that she's wanted for $10,000 for bank robbing and murder. Now, this this film had me in tears, but it also had me feeling very, very romantic. Note that there's also a significant age gap between the two characters. Now she steals a boy's heart as a woman and he is a virgin and is coming of age. So this is very, very much a love story. And although you've seen this Bonnie and Clyde combo a thousand times before, in this case, Margot Robbie and Finn Cole's sheer force of will are enough to keep you on your toes. Now note that there is 
a steamy shower scene that I'm going to make a big deal of. And this steamy shower scene is of Margot Robbie in Finn Cole, and you don't want to miss it. And those of you that don't know Finn, his, um, he's best known for his work on Peaky Blinders. Dreamland had its world premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2019 and was released this past November by Paramount Pictures. You can buy it for $14.99 or rent it for $3.99 on the many platforms like Amazon Prime, Apple TV, Google Play, and Fandango Now. But I promise you, it's going to be worth your while. Don't forget to head to RomulusEntertainment.com to see the great films that they've produced and the amazing lineup of films to come by this incredible production company. I am your host, Zen Sams. You're listening to A Moment of Zen on 710 WOR. Get your moment of Zen every Saturday night at 7 p.m. as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a wild ride covering film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective right here on 710 WOR. Welcome back, my sexy people. Remember to join me right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, every Saturday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Now, every week I strive to bring you the latest in film, fashion, pop culture, and entertainment, but I also strive to bring you the latest when it comes to skincare and beauty. As a model and as an actor, it's extremely important to always be camera ready. Plus, being a mom, it's also more important for me to feel good about myself. And I'm usually the last on the tend to list. So anything that makes me feel better about myself, I'm all for it. And you don't have to be a celebrity to invest in your body. Now, this spa that I'm about to talk to you guys about is located in Midtown Manhattan. It's called Renew V Spa. And I was turned on to this place by my close friend, uh, who is a former uh, NFL Giants player. And he was basically getting treatments done on his body. And I thought, hmm, that's quite interesting. So now I'm going to shift the focus to the incredible gals at Renew V Spa. And you can go to their website and check them out. That's RenewVSpa.com. And this procedure that I discovered is probably one of the best procedures that I've come across because it's truly making me feel so much better about my bikini bottom. So in the month of March, I started doing these uh, skin tightening treatments by laser. Uh, the laser treatment was that they used was the Venus Legacy. And then after the treatment, it was followed by contouring massages. So when the procedure is done, which is a very painless procedure, it takes about 45 minutes, then they use a Brazilian technique that is light and flowing that feels gentle and rhythmic, which is which is a massage. Um, and while, while it's designed to boost lymph flow and encourage fluid and waste drainage throughout the body, it's also very relaxing and tends to the nervous system. The reason I started resorting to these treatments is because the gym just wasn't enough. And my thighs always looked flabby. I could still see all my cellulite prone areas jumping out at me. And I know that that as an actor and as a model, people are going to say, you know, you have nothing to worry about. Your skin looks great. You always look good. But the reason I always look good is because I continue to do these treatments and tend to those areas. Renew V Spa is a very unassuming spot. They're very low key, which I love. And here's the best part. They cater to Victoria's Secret models, pro athletes, men and women, and they also cater to the average mom and dad. You'll start off with a consultation. That's how it happened for me. I walked in. They introduced me to all their techniques. Uh, we went through a list of my problem areas and what I wanted to see um, results in. And then they basically told me about the Venus Legacy. So the Venus Legacy is a laser machine, and it's all about... Uh, skin tightening, circumferential, and cellulite reduction, fewer wrinkles, and basically body contouring without surgery. It's also suitable for all skin tones and types with no risk of pigmentation changes. I've done about six treatments and saw a world of difference. This is also extremely affordable, but what I can say is that my skin has completely transformed in six sessions and my butt is no longer jelly. I've posted a lot of footage on my social media, uh, some before and afters as well. You can look at some of those videos on Instagram at Zen Sam's. That's Zen Sam's with an X and head to the website and get your body summer ready. Head to Renew V Spa. And remember, guys, this is not a paid endorsement. This is simply my true summer body secret. You're listening to Zen Sam's on 710 WOR. Get your moment of Zen every Saturday night at 7 p.m. as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sam's takes you on a wild ride covering film, fashion, pop culture, politics, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective right here on 710 WOR. 
Well, that's a wrap, my friends. Thank you for being loyal listeners. Many of you have already texted me for collaborations, and I love it. Keep those texts coming. Text feature me or collaboration to 917-575-2321. Again, that number is 917-575-2321. For those of you who are listening and want to see me, you can watch the full show on 710WOR.com. Remember to tune back in next Saturday at 7 p.m. I have some incredible guests lined up, and we're going to be chatting about some steamy, steamy stuff. Thank you for listening to A Moment of Zen. It's been an absolute pleasure being your host. Till next week. And remember... Happiness is the only thing that multiplies when you share it.